Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you as we continue this journey at the table with Jesus, right? These meals. I hope, I hope you've been enjoying food, and I hope you've been enjoying knowing Jesus just a little better throughout this season. Uh, before I begin, just a quick word of personal privilege. Many of you got word this week that uh, Reverend Gracie Millard passed her interviews for ordination. <laughs> So we're excited to celebrate that with her, and I just want to give you a heads up that on Monday, June the 3rd, I know that feels way out there, but mark your calendars, because that evening at 7 p.m. on June the 3rd will be her ordination service, and you'll be more than welcome to come. You're invited to celebrate her ordination. There's one of only four who are getting ordained this year, and so if she's one of those four, we're real excited about that. So I know you'll want to keep her in your prayers and celebrate with her in the days that lie ahead. Hey, as we think about meals, I, re I remembered that um, I probably, like you, every once in a while watch these cooking shows. Do you watch these, like, uh, you know, British Baking Show or Top Chef or any of them? I mean, there's a million of them now out there. And I happened just a couple of weeks ago to start up with Top Chef. I'd never really watched that before. And one of the, uh, you know, part of that is obviously cooking and, you know, challenging yourself. And one of the challenges was that they were to, the cooks, the chefs that were in the competition, were to cook a meal based on their heritage, what, whatever that was, ethnicity or country or background or whatever. They were supposed to cook a meal for their heritage. And some of them struggled with it. Some of them were real clear about what they were going to do. And, and uh, at one point, the, one of the judges said, you know, food transcends culture and barriers. And I thought, wow, how cool is that? Food transcends culture and barriers. And I think there's a lot of reality to that, right? That anytime we sit down at meal with somebody, uh, no matter what the food is or no matter what our backgrounds or differences are, there's a real sense that when I'm sitting down at table with someone else uh, and there's food there, that it really transcends all of our differences, right? That it helps act as a great connector, that it helps uh, make things possible that might not otherwise be possible. And what a great gift that is. And, and uh, now as I watched the show, I kind of got to see all the different ethnic foods and got to, you know, uh, have my saliva flow really fond after all of that, right? It's fun to watch those. And it reminds me of this series, Meals with Jesus, because a part of this goal is to recognize that whenever we're at table with Jesus, whatever that looks like, whether it's our own home meals over which we say grace or whether it's a, a gathering of friends or work colleagues, when we're with Jesus at the table, he's got something in store for us. Sometimes it's a lesson. Sometimes it's a, a, a word or a sense of God's grace. Sometimes it's a realization that God loves me no matter what, right? So when we sit at these tables with Jesus, these meals, we begin to discover that he really does love us, that he wants the very best for us, that he has an abundant life for us, that he has a wonderful opportunity for us, and that he wants to reveal himself in very real and tangible ways. That's the goal of our time with Jesus throughout this season of Lent. Now, we've been at a couple of private meals, right, in Simon's home and in the tax collector's home, and, and now today we're going to kind of broaden that out a little bit. We're going to have a, a public picnic, a place where a whole bunch of people are going to gather to eat with Jesus and the disciples, and there's going to be this great, great lesson for us. So this is one of the only miracles of Jesus that is in all four Gospels. It's called the Feeding of the 5,000. You may know it. Uh, it's a powerful story of the ways in which Jesus can feed us, and every gospel has it. But because we're in the gospel of Luke throughout the season of Lent, I want to read the account in Luke's gospel. And like all of them, there's, there's something unique and distinct within each gospel. And Luke has that in store for us today. So listen as Jesus eats with 5,000 of his closest friends. On their return, this is the disciples, he had just sent them off to begin their ministry. On their return, the apostles told Jesus all that they had done. Then taking them along, he slipped quietly into a city called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out about it, they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed to be healed. The day was drawing to a close and the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowds away so that they may go into the surrounding villages and countrysides to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a deserted place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. 
And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. They did so and had them all sit down. And taking five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were filled. And what was left over was gathered up 12 baskets of broken pieces. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Jesus is feeding people again, right? Jesus is having folks sit down and and gather together for a meal. And he's doing this after the disciples have already been sent out. He's called them and prepared them, and he sends them out to preach about the kingdom of God and to help uh, folks to come to know Christ and to recognize how the world is changing. And so when they come back, they're all excited. Uh, Here's here's what's happened, Jesus. Here's how all this has transpired. And they're sharing this good news with Jesus. And he says, hey, that's great. Let's come away to a quiet place or a lonely place called Bethsaida. And, And so they go. And um, as they go to this town of Bethsaida, I couldn't help but kind of think about Jesus gathering these 12 to go to a place called Bethsaida. Bethsaida is a fishing town. It's on the northeast coast of the Sea of Galilee. It's a place that um, didn't have a lot of folks, but it had a real clear purpose. And Jesus is taking his disciples there. And the more I thought about it, what they're about to do is feed a whole great big group of people, right, with just a few loaves and fish. And I thought about Jesus, and Jesus is born in Bethlehem. You remember Bethlehem? Bethlehem is a beautiful city. It unfortunately sits behind locked walls these days in what's called the West Bank, and you have to go through security checkpoints to get to Bethlehem now. But in Jesus' day, when he's born, it's a a thriving community, and, and Bethlehem, a town, literally means house of bread. That's what it means, house of bread. Jesus is from there, right? And now the man from the house of bread is going to take people to Bethsaida, and Bethsaida literally means house of those who fish or house where fishers take shape. He's about to distribute bread and fish. He's gone from the home of bread to the home of fish. I just find that fascinating, right? And he's about to do this in such a way that it's going to transform people's hearts and lives. It's going to help change who they are. And so after he has spent an entire day helping people understand the kingdom of God, notice that's what he spent his time doing. That entire day, it tells us, he was teaching them about the kingdom of God and healing those who needed to be cured. And so at the end of the day, the disciples are all wrapped up in themselves about how are we going to take care of these folks? We're out in this lonely place called Bethsaida, and we don't know where to go, and they're not going to have anything to eat, and what are we going to do with them all? And the the disciples get all wrapped up in what they're supposed to do. And Jesus simply says, you feed them. I get that it's the end of the day. I get we've been hanging out for a long time. I get that they're probably hungry. You feed them, right? He's challenging them. He's literally just had an all-day lesson about the kingdom of God in part, which says we need to serve others, we need to love others, we need to care for others, and he's giving them an opportunity. You feed them. Well, they, they, <laughs> they don't know what to do with that, right? Well, <laughs> We don't have enough food. How are we going to make this happen? How's this going to work? There's way too many people. There's no Tom Thumb across the street. How's this going to work, right? All they could make was excuses, excuse after excuse after excuse, and they don't know what to do. But a part of what Jesus is helping them to better understand is that they're called to serve, that they're called to be in ministry, and that they have now found in this moment their calling. Let's do it, guys. Let's make this happen. And all they can do is make excuses. So Jesus does what Jesus does so well. He makes a way where there seems to be no way, right? He realizes and takes up the uh, five loaves and two fish, and he literally takes them, blesses them, breaks them, and gives them. And you hear in those four actions what it is we do whenever we celebrate communion, right? Every time we gather around this table, we take, we bless, we break, we give, and God shows up, and God does amazing things through this, these simple elements of bread and of wine. He makes something of it. He turns it into something that was not before. He makes it something that feeds us both physically and spiritually. 
And so when Jesus has the people sit down in clumps of 50 people and he feeds the 5,000 men and other women and children, right? I mean, it tells us there's 5,000 men, but there's got to be thousands of other people there as well. And he feeds all of them. The simple loaves and fishes feed all of them. As if that weren't enough, man, they're gathering stuff up when it's all over with, right? And, and they gather up 12 baskets of broken pieces. Well, there's got to be something to that 12, right? I mean, why not 9? Why not 11? Why not 15? Why not 18? There's something about 12 that captivates us, right? There's, there's 12 disciples who are broken people, and they need these elements that have been gathered up. And a part of what Jesus is suggesting to us in a very simple way is not only can I feed these 5,000 and all the others who are with us together today, not only can I feed them and you, but I'm going to provide a way for you to continue your ministry of building the kingdom. I'm going to give you these broken pieces that emblematically resemble your brokenness. Because here's our reality, friends. Just like those 5,000 and just like those 12 who gathered, we're all broken. And we all need the help of Christ. We all need his strength. We all need his sustenance. And a part of what Jesus is pointing out to us through the feeding of the 5,000 is he's got the capacity to do this. It may not make any logical sense. It uh, It may not work in any traditional sense of the words. But it works in the ways in which Jesus makes it real. He takes bread, common, everyday, ordinary bread, and a couple of fish, and he feeds thousands upon thousands of people, and he challenges them to go serve. I cannot help but believe that Jesus is saying not only to the twelve, but to all of the other thousands of folks who've gathered, I've now fed you physically so that you are now spiritually sustained to do God's work. Bread's a funny thing, isn't it? Is there anybody here who doesn't like bread? I mean, it may not be your mainstay, right? And some of us are supposed to stay away from it. I get all that, right? In our household, there are two forms of carbs, the sugars that I eat and the bread that my lovely bride eats. And we love it. I love bread. Not supposed to eat it, but I love it. And a part of what I realize in the simple, common, ordinary elements of bread, yeast sometimes, flour, water, sometimes egg, sometimes milk, is all of those common, ordinary elements, when they come together, we believe they offer life. They are gifts from God. They are what make life possible. You know, the most common food element across all of the globe is some form of bread and some form of water. We get to add all kinds of things to our meals, but the vast majority of people the globe over are sustained by some form of bread and water because it is a gift that brings life, and it comes from God. And the Scriptures help remind us of that over and over and over again. I think just of the common prayer we pray every Sunday, and certainly we'll pray in just a few minutes, the Lord's Prayer. Luke gives us the rendering of it in Luke chapter 11, and a part of that prayer says, you will remember, give us each day our daily bread. It's a very common base element of our relationship with God, right? And then we can go all the way back in the Old Testament into the Hebrew Scriptures. And one of the mainstays was as the Israelites were coming out of slavery and bondage in Egypt uh, to the Exodus to find their freedom. Exodus chapter 16 tells us about the manna in the wilderness, right? And a part of it of what God says to Moses is, I will rain down on you bread from heaven. And you'll have all that you need. Now take only what you need each day, but I will provide for you this bread from heaven, right? And then there's that passage from uh, 1 Samuel that's fascinating about David when he's hungry. He's got some of his men with him, and he's, he's actually going to conquer, but he's out in the fields, and, and they're hungry. They're famished. And 1 Samuel tells us that they go into the temple, and the priest gives them the bread of the presence that only the priest is supposed to eat. 
It is this passage that Jesus would refer to when he's teaching on the Sabbath and people are condemning him. And he says, do you not recall what David did with his men? And they went in and ate the bread of the presence in the temple. Bread brings life. And it comes as this powerful gift from God. I remember a little known story uh, from 2 Kings about Elijah. Elisha is, is uh, out and he, he needs to feed a, a flock of people. It's only about 100 folks. But 2 Kings uh, chapter 4 tells us that um, a man brings him 20 loaves of bread and he takes those loaves and he distributes them among the 100. And it is an Old Testament version of the feeding of the 5,000 because after he's fed the 100, there's lots left over. And it's a beautiful image of the way that God can provide where there seems no way. And then there's that other little-known story of Paul. He's, he's making his journey to Rome. It's his fourth missionary journey. It's, recount, it's recounted in the book of Acts. And as he goes on this ship, he knows, and everybody on the ship knows, it's going to shipwreck before they get there. But he wants to bring them comfort and hope, and he brings a little bit of assurance to them, and then he serves them a meal. And it tells us in Acts 37, quite literally, they broke bread, he gave thanks, and he gave it to the people, and they all ate heartily bringing everyone on the ship peace and strength and comfort and hope. Bread is a fascinating thing. It's the very base element of one of our sacraments. And it is always this gift from God that far too often in our diets we take for granted. In fact, we sort of banish from time to time, right? And yet, from the very beginnings of creation, Throughout and across the globe, bread is a gift that brings life. I remember several years ago, the first time that I went to Israel, we were in the old city of Jerusalem, literally in the heart. And as we are traveling through the city, I happened to notice several times bread stuffed in walls. And I thought, this is weird. What, what is this bread for? I didn't understand. And in my simple mind, I thought... <laughs> Maybe this is a real cheap way to put mortar together or something. I don't know. What, what is this? And so I asked our guide. I said, what's up with all this bread? I see it in various places throughout the old city. That was the only place I ever saw it. It may have been other places, but it was only in the old city, Jerusalem, that I happened to have seen it. And he said to me, well, here's, here's why that is. In the, in the city, bread, we, they're reminded that bread is life, that it is a gift from God and should never be thrown away but rather offered to others as a sign of life and a sign of hope. And so people will stuff it in the walls rather than throw it away so that any beggar or any homeless person might have a morsel. And I thought to myself, wow, how cool is that? I mean, I, I wouldn't eat that bread, but I'm sure somebody would if they were hungry enough, right? It literally would be a gift. It would be this opportunity for life. And it made all the sense in the world to me about something that I had seen earlier the same day when I witnessed a man do something I'd never seen before and I didn't understand until our guide told us. I had seen a man take what, what I didn't know then was a piece of bread in his hand and I saw him kiss what was in his hand and then stuff it in the wall. And then he kissed his hand again. And then he looked up and he kissed the air. And I now realized, having heard from the guide, that that man was offering life to somebody else. Someone he would never see, someone who would never have the opportunity to thank him, someone who would never have the possibility of knowing who it was that gave him the bread. But that man was acknowledging that the bread itself was a gift. That's why he kissed it, that it was a gift from God. That's why I looked up to God and why he offered what I assume was some form of a blessing as he gave it away. Bread is life. Jesus is the bread of life. And when he feeds us, he calls us into service. You see, that's what we do at communion. Not only when we come to this meal do we receive the gift of God's forgiveness, do we receive the presence of Christ in our life, do we understand perhaps in a more real way that God's mercy and love is real and tangible. But when we come to this table, we also are fed physically so that we can serve 
spiritually the world. A part of Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God is that we are to be God's servants in the world, building God's kingdom, creating hope for others, helping those in need, offering bread and water to the hungry and the thirsty. So when we come for spiritual sustenance, we are strengthened for our service in the world. This is what was happening at that picnic when Jesus said to the disciples, you go feed them, that wasn't a metaphor. <laughs> it wasn't a pleasant thought. It was a challenge to do what it is we're called to do, offer hope to the world, to break down barriers, to help serve those in need. And it brought back the words from the judge on top chef, food sometimes transcends culture and barriers. Friends, that's what this meal does. It transcends culture and barriers. And it equips us to do what it is Jesus calls us to do. Much like the disciples, we will often say, I'm not ready, I don't have an answer, I don't know how to do that, I'm not prepared, I'm not equipped, I don't know how to make this happen. At some point in our lives, I bet every last one of us has said something like that when we got that inner urge from Jesus, I'm calling you, <laughs> or the Holy Spirit was kind of nudging us out to the go door to go take care of something or help somebody out, and we're making excuse after excuse. There's not enough food here, Jesus. Are we supposed to go buy this food? We're good at making excuses, but Jesus, ma Jesus made it happen. Jesus made it possible, and that's the gift that we receive today. When we come to the table, my prayer for all of us is that we'll receive his spiritual sustenance so that we can go do what it is he's calling us to do, you see. This meal with Jesus, it's important. It has impact on our hearts and our lives, and it challenges us to serve Christ daily. May that be our call. May that be our nourishment. May it be the way we become prepared to do God's good work in the world. Will you pray with me? Holy and blessed God, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that he really is the bread of life. Help us, Lord, this day as we receive his sustenance, the very presence of Jesus. May we feast on his body. May we sup on his blood. May we recognize his presence in very real and tangible ways. And may we be strengthened to serve him in the world. God, this is our prayer. And we lift it in the name of Jesus, whom we know to be the Christ. Amen.